everybody. Um, we're really excited to have the, so many people online today. Um, the Admin Ops Committee has been meeting pretty regularly since March. Um, you know, normally we meet about personnel topics and training, and this year we've been meeting a lot about COVID and all the regulations and requirements that that's brought to districts that we're having to deal with now. Um, and Terry has been gracious and joined us on several of those calls, so we're really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, the Admin Ops Committee will continue to meet through um, the end of the year. Um, I, we're talking with Terry about some other sessions now. Um, so any questions that don't get answered today, you know, don't worry, we can cover those at our next admin call. Um, but I wanna introduce Terry for those that don't know her. It's Terry Higgins and um, she's an Associate Director at the Henricopolis District and at Loudoun. And we've been using her. She's just such an incredible resource for all the districts across the state. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Terry. Um, HR is her specialty and we're gonna let her get started. Good morning, Terry. Good morning. <clears throat> I think I just pop up by talking. So um, here I am. You don't really need to see me. So I'm just going to dive right in, um, stop my video and switch to share screen. So here we go. Okay, we talked with Kendall about and uh, Susie and everybody about what we really needed to cover in kind of our next session for this one. So we've got a variety of topics in addition to reminding folks about some co compliance needs. So first things first, compliance is really critical. So we thought we'd start there. Um, the first thing is the required assessments. I've tried to boil down the whole, everybody's familiar with Virginia's emergency temporary standard requirements. They're the first, Bosch was the first in the country to issue standards like this. And there's something that we all need to re, um, we're all required to comply with. So I thought if your district was still in the middle of it or hadn't yet quite tackled it, didn't know where to start, we had a lengthy section, session last month and it is online. So you can get more detail that way or certainly reach out to me. But I thought I'd give everybody just a quick high level um, reminder of what those uh, things are we need to do to comply with Virginia's new standards. Uh, I've broken them down into nine steps. The first one is to do those required assessments. I've given you tools that you can now Google and find different formats of tools to assess both your workplace and each position. So you need to look at the tasks that each position in your district performs and make a determination whether these um, tasks are low risk, medium risk, high risk, or very high risk. And you'll see on the slide that I've got in front of you right now, I've given you definitions for each one of those so that you have quick and easy guidelines to go by, whether you use the tool we've provided or you wanna try to find something simpler. The tool that I've provided is very comprehensive. It's built right out of the requirements um, from VOSH. And then that also applies to your workplace. You're gonna have to look through that criteria that I would start at least with the worksheet that we've provided to do the assessment because it is very comprehensive to the standards specifically. And you'll need to make a determination about your workplace's risk level. And just for a tip in case this helps, and your, Vosh has suggested that unless an assessment demonstrates otherwise, most workplaces, positions, and jobs and tasks that your folks are doing are going to be medium risk. So you'll want to do those assessments just to make sure you aren't high risk in some areas, but primarily, you know, if you need a shortcut, you'll want to do an assessment, but likely you're going to come out to medium risk. Um, and that's based on the suggestions and feedback from Bosch themselves. Um, oh, I've done some highlighting. I forgot that. Uh, <laughs> the um, First thing you've got to do with all this is the symptoms-based screening. And that's where you need to have your employees do self-assessments. There's really tool two, tool twos, two tools to use, sorry about that, for screening. You could designate somebody to screen all the employees coming in, but our districts are also small that self-screening is really the way to go. And I think most districts have 
adopted that measure. You just need to have a form um, or checklist something where they can, when they, before they come into the office and the workplace, before they interact with any of your landowners and customers or each other, that they can go through the symptoms checklist and make sure that they're not symptomatic that day. And then they can either fill out the little form that we provided and just um, hang on to that for their records, or you can add it as a, we've, I've seen some great logs where it's just a checkbox that yes, I'm entering today and yes, I've self screened myself. Um, so that's, that's a really important compliance piece. And it is, all of these are mandatory, just so you're wondering, in case you're wondering. The other thing is to establish some policies and procedures. And the goal around VOSH is to prevent sick employees and other in persons from infecting your employees and then other employees who may, or persons who may be in your workplace. Um, you're going to be required to assess, get creative and look at some of the engineering, administrative and work practice controls that you might be able to put into place to um, help eliminate or reduce exposure and those interactions. And that can be things as simple as installing a piece of plexiglass, rearranging an office to ensure that you've got, you know, if somebody stands in the doorway, that a person seated at a desk is, can be six feet from them. They're not always complicated. It can be very simple things um, as far as mitigating measures. You can uh, put up signs, and that's one thing that they put in there that's required to post your um, social distancing signs, and those were included in a previous um, handout. The standard does require that all employees observe those physical distance requirements of six feet. It also requires that you provide and require employees to wear their coverings. So you're, they can voluntarily bring their own. So if you've got somebody who is very fashionista and they want to provide their own cloth face coverings, they are allowed to do that, but you're also required to make sure that face coverings are available to all employees. You'll need to make sure that you've got your signs up and markers on the floor and things like that, that any PPE that would be required, you've probably already got in place for those things, so that's not really new for us. Face coverings is the big newbie. And then all of the cleaning and disinfecting supplies, hand washing stations, hand sanitizer stations, you'll be required to provide those things that are EPA compliant. Uh, they do, um, they've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of pushback and a lot of calls. So you'll see at the very end of this page, I've given you a click here so that if someone wants to file a complaint related to face coverings or social distancing, um, they're now, they can do that online. And that little click here is where they can go and do that. Um, the next step would be to minimize all of that in-person workplace and job-related contact. And they're requiring employers to implement to the extent feasible um, temporary flexible sick leave policies, temporary accrued paid leave use policies, and communicate how they have those flexibilities. So normally for childcare purposes, maybe you don't allow folks to use their sick leave in this circumstances during the pandemic, you might want to le let folks who, you know, have to make other arrangements and handle things use that sick leave in addition to any accrued vacation or annual leave, those kinds of things. Um, you'll see on a slide later, I'm not going to go into great detail, but as people tend to exhaust paid leave at this point, the Congress has uh, implemented the a, a new act uh, that creates that to pay leave off time at certain rates. And I don't want to do it now because I have a slide later, but we'll talk about what that option is as well. But you need to communicate that. Um, identify and implement uh, mitigating measures. And those are things like um, teleworking, which a lot of folks are already doing, staggering shifts so that maybe you're here in the morning, so in, if folks need to be in the office, I'm here in the morning, Susie's here in the afternoon, Kendall's here the tomorrow morning, and Shannon's here the next afternoon, so that folks are coming in at different times and you only have one person in the office at a time, especially if it's small. If you have um, a large enough office, 
I think if I remember Hanover Carolines is pretty large back in there, you could probably direct your traffic and space your folks out well enough. You could have multiple people in, but otherwise they're looking for you to really limit those occupancies and then post that. Um, virtual meetings, um, that's one thing that they're really kind of stringent about, the in-person meetings. That's because Zoom is a lot of, you can get a lot of free tools for this team. Microsoft has released Teams, which is a free app. Zoom has a free level. So virtual meetings is one that there is really a high expectation. And contact deliver, contactless delivery of goods and services. So that's things like when your pizza guy drops the pizza, rings the bell and runs. You know, are there things you could do? Could you, you know, arrange for a contactless pickup of keys to the piece of equipment that your district rents or set up a process for if you are still getting deliveries at the office, you know, what's the process for them dropping off and notifying you. Um, you do need to have a process in place and communicate how you want employees to immediately report their symptoms to the districts. And that policy should also include that they have to remove themselves from the workplace and seek appropriate medical guidance and follow up on that. Let's see. Step five is preventing sick employees from infecting and exposing others. And that comes back to the policy we really just kind of talked about. How are they going to notify you um, if they're experiencing the symptoms, if they've taken a test, if they've received those test results, or if they've had contact with a known or suspected infected person. Um, so make sure you have temporary policies around that. And again, a lot of this sounds overwhelming, but if you look at the materials that we've previously supplied online, you guys can really take those and just adapt them or take them and run with those. So it, it should make it a lot easier. Um, next is prevent asymptomatic persons from entering the workplace and reporting to you. And they also require asymptomatic persons. Asymptomatic persons most of the times if they haven't been tested, don't know they have it. But if you have a person who has been tested for COVID and is not in displaying symptoms, that's considered asymptomatic. And those are the folks that you need to have them report that they've tested positive, have them stay out of the workplace, and make sure that they only return to work through a test-based strategy. So they do have to, when you look through some of the training materials, that you'll see and in addition to this, that that is two negative tests within a 24 hour period. Um, prohibit employees um, through a test-based or symptom-based strategy. And you'll see in some of the other materials that we've already shared with you guys, what the symptom-based test looks like and what the test-based test looks like. Uh, the other thing that's really important, you'll hear folks in the media and other places talk about, you know, 24 hour symptoms um, no longer displayed and 24 hours after returning to work to wear a mask. VOSH requires three days. So make sure that when you are writing up your policies that your return to work policies is three days symptom free, three days fever without a mitigating measure, three days when they're back to work in your workplace that they're wearing a face covering at all times while they're there. So they're in the ladies room or the men's room, the kitchen, their workspace at the copier, wherever, they're gonna need that face mask on for three full day, full work days upon return to work. Uh, communicate and establish processes for notification. Um, this is really uh, this one's referring to your rights and responsibilities, both for your employees and as employers. And there's a long list in some of the previously provided materials of things that you have to give notice on. I've also compiled a lengthy document, but it's, a, it's actually a quick read because it's all posters and signage and things that meet the requirements that you're required to email or provide in person, however you want to do it, as long as you're socially distanced in person. Uh, information rights, notifications, requirements, things like that for, to all employees. So that's been compiled for an easier way to share that. Um, establish a process for notify, notifying employees and building owners and any other on-site employers of any 
workplace exposures to the virus for your employees, any suspected or confirmed test results that are positive so that they can take the necessary actions to protect their own and their like occupants and their employees um, health and safety. You have to notify the Virginia Department of Health of a confirmed positive test result within 24 hours of becoming aware of the exposure or contact. And there is a nice online reporting portal for that now to make that really easy and you can just fill it in and they basically the VDH will take it from there. They'll do the contact tracing and things like that. Um, they do ask that you do some notifications because they don't have enough contact tracers and things like that and they want to make sure that the spread's being mitigated. So you'll see included in the um, notifications for the employees a process for how they can think through who they've been in contact with with and then there's also a script and a list for them to note so they can also notify people that they may have exposed or come into contact with um, one thing that's really really important is if you do have someone suspected or confirmed positive with COVID and you do need to notify others that you have a suspected case or a confirmed case of COVID you do not release the name of the employee or the person who's known or suspected infected to anybody but the VDH. Um, otherwise, you're violating HIPAA regulations. So you just need to say, and I know it's gonna sound silly, you know, in an office of like three people, you're gonna figure out who's not coming to work for 14 days. Um, but it, it is a compliance requirement. It is a federal regulation that you do not disclose those names. So you'll just want to send a message that says there's been an, um, a known contact with an exposed person, you know, at this date and time, and then let them know that, you know, if they've had contact, they may need to isolate, self-quarantine, just monitor for checking. And there's a really nice, um, I guess it's a grid or assessment that you can go through and look at first degree, second degree, third degree contact and kind of figure out what, what actions you need to take in some of the other materials we've provided. Um, this one sounds really big and scary, step seven, but it really only applies if your district has 11 or more employees and medium risk um, workplace or jobs. So I don't think any of our districts are big enough for that maybe Thomas Jefferson, I'm not sure, because I think they might have a larger district uh, staff, but I think this one will likely not apply. Or the second part of the disease preparedness and response plan, if you have to develop it, would the first criteria is 11 or more employees and jobs classified as medium risk, or if your district has jobs classified as high or very high. Very high is very unlikely, simply because if you go back and look at the definition of what um, high risk is, it's typically your um, healthcare, medical lab, those kinds of folks uh, that have that close contact, potential risk to aerosol carrying droplets and things. And the only risk that could be high for districts might be that I could think of, but definitely think through in your, in your district, would be if you have uh, employees who maybe volunteer as an EMT or on a fire, you know, as a volunteer firefighter, volunteer EMT, ambulance runs, those kinds of things. So you might want to think about how you handle that uh, in your workplace. And that would be just one factor. So you're going to want to come up with a process around that person or that particular one. But I don't think it lends itself from everything that I've uh, been participating in and getting uh, information on that that necessarily would incite your need to uh, create a whole preparedness response plan. Really, it would become under more of the mitigating measure, workplace control practice. Uh, step eight is your anti-discrimination provisions. Those really all apply as they have under OSHA for years. Um, you, you can't discriminate in the employment relationship in any way, whether it's discharge, prohibit from promotion, um, anything like that. If, they've, if an employee's exercise their rights under these provisions for the temporary standard or OSHA, 
whether it's for themselves or for others. So if somebody thinks they're looking out for someone else and reports something, you know, they're still protected, even though they didn't report, you know, hey, I feel unsafe about something. Um, you, we can't uh, discriminate if they voluntarily choose to wear their own personal pr uh, protective equipment. So if you provide face shields, but they have something that goes on more like, um, this would be an extreme, but a welder's helmet, but I've seen some now online where they're a lot more clear than that, that folks are, are wearing if they're extremely worried or maybe in high risk situations. So we can't prohibit their use of their own equipment as long as it doesn't create a greater hazard for themselves or other employees. Um, we can't discriminate if they raise a reasonable concern about the infection control measures. For example, if you have a busy office and you put out a plexiglass uh, shield, interestingly enough, they're selling a ton of the ones that are just freestanding, which is great because in a state other than Virginia, that would comply as a mitigating measure. But in Virginia, our barriers have to be immo immovable, immobilized, I guess is the word. So what you'd want to do is figure out a way to, um, I saw a very clever thing in one of the presentations I followed for training was they put uh, Velcro on the bottom of the plexiglass and then they put Velcro on it. You apparently can get these two part tapes and voila, it was immobile. So say you have a mobile one up and it keeps getting knocked around, moved aside, whatever, and someone wants to complain about that, you can't discriminate against them. You, you need to address it, you know, however best you can. Feasible is the word that Bosch keeps using. And if a employee feels unsafe because of a reasonable fear of injury or death, that's stand, been standard in OSHA for years. So OSHA is always superseding where it's greater than Bosch and there are particular instances where it is. And the next one is an instance of where it is, where OSHA would also supersede Bosch, the temporary standard. Training, Bosch requires training to all district employees based on the level of work you've assessed. So if you're medium risk, which is what they suggest at most places are and what um, I geared a whole training presentation so you can be in compliance by having your folks watch. Um, every employee needs to watch or participate in that training or whatever training you come up with for meeting the Bosch requirements. But where OSHA supersedes, it's not just all district employees. For the OSHA standards, anyone who could be in your workplace uh, re reasonably be in your workplace. And that would include, and they do specify in OSHA, elected, appointed officials, interns, volunteers, temps. So if you have a temp agency or a temp it, temporary position, somebody temporarily helping out. Contractors, those are along the lines of not somebody remodeling your kitchen or doing a repair. They're, this contractors applies to things like federal contractors where they're in there to work on behalf of the district. So basically anybody who's going to be in your district's workplace on behalf of the district, um, they're going to need to go through the training that's provided. And that was as quick as I could go through the steps. And really, it sounds like so much, um, but we do have a ton of things already out there. And you'll see at the top of each one of these little pages as we flick through it, I've cited the, the Virginia code, the Vosh code, so that it pushback from folks, you can say, hey, don't agree with it, but go to Vosh 220-80, go to Vosh 220-30, go, and you can direct them right to the um, legislation or the temporary standards um, and regulations that actually are mandating whatever you're asking them to do. Right above that, you'll also see I've given everybody a link in the presentation so you can go to where we have all of the COVID guidance posted online. I think we're ready for questions. Carrie, thank you so much. You're right. We did spend two hours last month going through some of the mandatory requirements and you did a great job kind of recapping, summarizing and bringing it full circle for us here. But I know there's going to be definitely some questions. I've seen two and see another one coming in in the chat box now to address some of the ones we had earlier. Is paid sick leave offered to part-time employees or also does it need to be? 
Linda, did you need to clarify that question any further? If you are, if you have a district policy and part-time employees are not eligible for paid leave benefits, you do not have to start to offer it, but you can use the FFCRA. Um, they can use two weeks of that for their regular leave. Um, and they may qualify for um, prorated leave. When we get to that standard, you'll see where uh, the different standard applies and you'd have to pay only the benefits as specified under the FFCRA. Yeah, so this is Linda Dunn. Um, Part-time employees earn paid time off, but it's at 0 0.05 hours per um, hour worked. Um, so a lot of us don't have much sick time available. So I wasn't sure what the regulations are if one of us does become sick and we have to self-quarantine for the 14 days. Um, are we... Uh, will we be paid for that time if we don't have enough time saved up? You would first be paid out of your accrued leave and then you would only be paid in accordance with the FFCRA policy. And beyond okay. that, you've exhausted the benefits under the FFCRA, then it would be unpaid time. Okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Here we have another question. Sherry, I haven't forgotten about yours, but I'm going to do the other sick leave question since it might help Linda and follow up to this. Sharon Connor had a question about a general sick leave question. How does the district go about setting up a leave bank? They have employees that have sick leave that they will most likely never use and newer employees that could use additional sick leave, especially since we're asking folks to stay home more often when sick. Uh, a mm -hmm. bank would be nice to have for those approved situations, but it needs to be equitable and legal. Do you have examples, Terry, and could you provide a policy for us to use as a template? I can provide a policy as a template. You'll need to email me so I can share that with you. Um, it's really not difficult. You need to have a form um, that, that employees would have to complete and sign that says, you know, I'm willing to transfer this many to a leave bank. And the leave bank can be a simple spreadsheet in that form that an employee has, um, has completed that says I'm willing to give up my accrued benefit because they need to give that up willingly. Um, then once you have the form and you've set up a spreadsheet to track it, then you would have a form, you will need a form to apply for it and you can set the criteria up around, there's a lot of flexibility in how those are set up simply because they're not a mandated benefit, they are voluntary benefits. So you can set the criteria around how that leave would get distributed. And then you just have to, when folks submit the form requesting that leave, then you would just need to make sure it complies with the requirements and you would then pay them at that employee's hourly rate, um, however many hours you're, you loan them out of the bank. But it's really a simple process. It's not terribly complicated. You just need a form to relinquish and a form to approve use and then a spreadsheet to track it. That's the easiest way to manage it. And apologize. Oh, sorry. No, I think that's really helpful. And I know a template policy might be of handy for a number of districts. I see a follow-up question from Sharon there, but also if other districts on the line actually do have a leave bank, drop it in the chat box. Maybe we can all connect and share resources if there are already ones out there doing it. Sharon asks, can an employee who is retiring transfer unused leave, Terry? Yes, but again, you'll want to have that policy. You'll, you'll want to do the bank thing. You'll want to um, have them voluntarily um, relinquish that, you'll want to have a place to track it, and then you'll want to have a form to distribute it. So yeah, you'll just need to set up that bank and policy around it with those three tools. It's really a simple process, not as daunting as it sounds. Thank you. Sharon, I think that captured it. Stop me if not before I move to the next question. Okay. We have one other question, I believe, in the chat box from Sherry Raglan. Terry, she was speaking to your logs when you were addressing that as contact tracing and all. Logs for self-assessments are mandatory. Where do we keep these logs and who will need to see them? Um, logs for self-assessment should be extremely generic. So you can just keep them in a basket so that you have them somewhere that you can lock them up, obviously. But uh, you could have a, I saw somebody who did it, was it maybe Ann Coates? 
did one that was just a checklist when they sign in and you just put simply put a check and then you keep your log of who's been in the workplace and then that way you can use that for contact tracing or if you use the little self check log just have employees drop it somewhere um, a slot a box that's whatever that it doesn't ask questions that create a HIPAA or medical record. So if you choose to have them fill out a form versus modifying an attendance log, uh, just make sure that you use the one provided so you don't create a medical record and create um, HIPAA complications. Just help. Sherry, did that capture your needs? I've got one more question in the chat box. Oh, nope, Sherry, did you want to follow up to that? The logs in the, the, um, the self-screening is all in materials that are online at the um, at, uh, Kindle's made, uh, state site. So you're right on a couple things to note here. For folks on the line, at the end of the presentation, you'll see not only the great links Terry's been putting in your presentation, but we'll send to all the folks who registered and attended today the links to the materials on our website, those logs that uh, TJ has created that we're using at the association office are examples already on the website that you can pull and tweak to be your own. Um, also, uh, some of the materials that she's talked about in her presentation we'll send out as attachments as well as this PowerPoint itself. Um, before I leave this question, I'm not sure if Sherry can come off mute, but um, Terry, I think she also wanted to know if these have to be reviewed by someone or audited. No, you just need to collect them to show that you're complying. Okay. I'm going to Sherry, loop back with me if that didn't quite address your needs, but I also have one question in the chat box, Terry, about does anyone have a HIPAA disclosure waiver form in case an employee wants to allow you to mention their name if they are suspected or diagnosis? Is that even allowable? I would not do that. Um, I, I would not disclose. Uh, there is probably a waiver form you can get online. I'm sure I could get one at SHRM if somebody really wanted one. Um, I would stick with Bosch because Bosch is folded under HIPAA and HIPAA is, is a really big deal and um, folks are super aware of it right now because if you paid attention to the media at all, you'll notice that um, we didn't get any information about the president. He evoked his HIPAA rights. So it's something folks know now. So I would just not violate HIPAA. I would just say you know i appreciate you want folks to know folks may figure it out if you want to reach out you can voluntarily reach out and contact people um but if from the district standpoint you know in a compliance and protect the district kind of measure protect your privacy um that we're not going to disclose terry i have one last question submitted to me of um, for logs and contact tracing and these self-assessment forms Really, there's no need to keep them longer than 14 days, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you only need to go back the 14 days uh, for any reporting or suspected contact. Perfect. I recognize that's a records management question also. I think I have captured all the questions that have been sent to me or in the chat box. I would ask if there's any questions, conversations you might have right now before we move to Terry's next component of the presentation. Ready? I think we're good. Okay. So other things that we didn't want to lose sight of because these times are so chaotic and unusual and seem to be ongoing for an indeterminate amount of time is what, what, what are the other kinds of things we need to know to help manage your district during these chaotic times? There are a couple things that I didn't want us to lose sight of. Um, if I can get this to turn, was if you'll remember, we've had some legislative sessions with the General Assembly this year, and there were legislative changes that became effective July 1st. And I don't want anybody to lose sight of that to make, uh, make sure we're in compliance for when folks are back in the workplace. And for some of this stuff that is notification 
publication of rights that needs to go out. It's going to be in that big um, PDF that Kendall's going to send later, send you a, either send you the PDF or send you a link to later. So that's one thing that you definitely want to send that PDF out to all your district folks um, is that that PDF so that you can show a record in a, of an email transaction that says they've got the information. Um, so these are the policy changes I didn't want us to lose sight of from the Virginia legislative changes. The EEO statement in your handbook needs to be updated and your non-discrimination policy to reflect changes in the Virginia Human Rights Act and the Virginia Values Act. Um, one, to that they're, the district won't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, no discrimination, they're not interested in discriminating on any ethnic trait. And the most familiar example of that that you hear a lot about are the native, what they call native or natural hairstyles. Um, and then a process for reporting and, and investigating allegations of harassment and discrimination. So that's gonna, um, that one will touch a different policy, but those are the three required policies and notifications. And they're, again, the notifications are in that handout but your policies will be on, you know, your responsibility to update for your district. Um, I know when I have helped various districts with review their policies, that some um, still have maternity policies and some folks have removed them as recommended and some folks have not. Um, now we do need to have those retired with the changes in the legislation and the new pregnancy and childbirth birth regulations that come under um, the Human Rights Act for Virginia and the Values Act. So make sure that you get those maternity policies out of your handbooks. Make sure that you do incorporate a simple statement in your FMLA policy that just um, notes that uh, maternity or pregnancy really, pregnancy uh, and related conditions will be handled in accordance with the FMLA. The other thing is, have you added a lactation accommodation policy? This one was enacted a few years ago, and I noticed uh, um, several districts did not have those going through policy and handbooks. And uh, if you have three men in your office or half a dozen, everybody's all male, it's still the law you have a lactation policy because you don't know when you're going to hire a female and she may well need to um, have an accommodation for, for lactation. Uh, revise your policy, defining your full-time, part-time, hourly, temporary, non-exempt, exempt, and include definitions of the employees. Um, that's a new requirement because of so many employers, and that, this, isn't how, this isn't a big thing for districts, but the compliance piece of having this policy is, uh, but kind of the instigation behind that, if you will, is that so many employers were misclassifying employees as contractors. If they get a W-2, they're an employee. If they get a W-9, they're a contractor. It's really that simple. But you do need to make sure your policy reflects, you know, these things in your personnel handbook. Um, revise your employment application if you have a standalone application or whatever you're using. The state's probably already amended those if you use that one to ban the box and that's uh, related to the marijuana use and felonies and things like that. Um, under the Fair Pay Act that's um, been implemented in Virginia and that's pending the Senate in um, Congress, uh, revise your application to remove salary history. So that's probably going to, depending on how the election goes, that'll probably come up federally as well as at a state level. And then retire any policy related to discussion of employees' pay. That violates the National Labor Relations Act. And um, they've been pretty aggressive about enforcing that, um, enforcing that for some reason. Um, just as a reminder, those are the things, the few things that we need to have not lost sight of. And I put check boxes you'll see so that you can just check them off. You can use this presentation really as a guide and a checkbox to know you're done. But just as a reminder, um, outside of the Virginia legislative changes, the Fair Labor Standards Act changed the salary threshold effective January 1st. And the new threshold, they've dropped it from the um, 
one that was preliminary advanced by Obama, and that was at 47,000. It's now $35,568. So when you do your FLSA test for exemption, if all of your duties, you, well, let me start at the beginning. You'll remember, hopefully, that it's a two-pronged test. It's a salary test and a duties test. So if your position's job duties pass 100% of the job duties test to be exempt, and now your employee makes more than the 35568 you could convert that employee from non-exempt to exempt. So I just wanted to make sure we just hadn't lost sight of that since the threshold had dropped by about $12,000 um, from the on-hold threshold. It's actually gone up from the like 40 or 50 year old threshold, but it's dropped from the one that um, the legal community advised everybody proceed with. Let's see, here's the Family First Coronavirus Act, the FFCRA that I talked about. Um, I wasn't gonna go into this one too much, but since we've had the questions, I'll cover it a little bit more here. Um, especially as the pandemic lingers, your district may have employees who run out of their paid leave and their flexible use of the paid leave that they have accrued. And so they may need to shift to these paid leave benefits under the um, Families First uh, Coronavirus Act. This one provides paid sick leave if the employee, um, and it only applies to these six conditions that they would be eligible to receive this expanded pay. Um, if, the, if the employee is subject to a quarantine or isolation order, if they've been advised by their health care provider to self-quarantine um, for a COVID-related reason, if they're experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis, if they're caring for an individual that's subject to an order or self whether it's self-quarantine or seeking the um, advice. It, and then those are the ones where you get paid at 100% um, up to the maximum that you'll see for two weeks. Uh, so it would be just two weeks of additional pay. And then numbers five and six are really for caring about, caring for your child. So schools closed or your daycares closed. That under, for that reason, um, four, five, and six, you can get two thirds of your pay for that two weeks, two weeks of time. So it's basically just these six reasons. And then the next section is what you're eligible for, for just the two weeks of additional pay and at the rates. Part-time folks, um, I know the question was about part-time folks. What you want to do for those folks is look at what would their normally scheduled hours for that two week period be and that's all they're eligible eligible for. So if they normally would have worked 20 hours per week and they're um, they've been advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine, then the first bullet would apply. They'd be eligible to receive 100% of their pay. Uh, up to 40 hours for those two weeks because it would be 20 hours per week. That's 40 hours times their regular rate of pay. And at that point, they would have maximized their um, FFCRA benefit. A part-time is only ex um, eligible for the expanded paid family medical leave for the numbers they are regularly scheduled as well. And what that um, applies to is this very last note on this page where it says employees may be eligible for up to a maximum of 12 weeks of consecutive or intermittent paid leave. And that's under the expanded Family and Medical Leave Act. That would be paid at two thirds of the rate for number five only. Otherwise, it's unpaid just like the uh, family and medical leave. The really important thing here that has tripped um, employees up more so than employers is that employees get excited and they they think, oh great, I've got another 12 weeks on top of FMLA. It isn't in addition to, it's concurrent with. So say you had your, um, your knee replaced and you were off work for six weeks, and now you need to be off work for reason number five to take care of your child. You would only have six weeks of your FMLA benefit remaining. So this last bullet on the page would only apply to those six weeks. So it doesn't give you an additional 12 weeks. It is the same set of weeks. It's just adding pay under certain conditions for that 12-week period. 
that one is that one can get confusing. Um, we I've done whole webinars, participated in whole webinars on that. So if you run into that situation, you might want to reach out and via email and share your circumstances to make sure we get that one right for your folks. Um, the ADA and the pandemic. Um, this is probably going to come up as the pandemic lingers and you have folks who want to request an accommodation. Um, the one thing that's clear under the ADA as well as Bosch is that we can't um, an antibody test and that's the one where you test for you know can do you have those um, antibodies to fight the, the COVID virus that one is considered a medical examination and we cannot require that under the Bosch or the ADA uh, and it cannot be used for decisions about returning to work it's only the viral COVID test that you can require for return to work and um, for any ADA accommodations. The viral test can be required, but it cannot be paid for by the employee. So if the employee for some reason gets to where they're going and they say, oh, no, nope, it's $20 copay, make sure your employee brings the, gets you the $20 copay and you reimburse that. Um, under the ADA, you can, you do have rights, they've clarified to ask if an employee's feeling, uh, feeling ill, had trouble getting that one out, um, or if they call in sick, you can ask them questions about their symptoms. So you could go through that symptoms chart, um, just like it, you were going through a workplace screening to make sure that, yeah, you need to be at home, don't come into the office. You can ask why they didn't report. That's always a right uh, for an employer to know why an employee's not showing up for their to do their job. Um, you can, this is one where um, lots of folks get um, passionate. If they've been traveling under the ADA, if you if it's to a suspected hotspot somewhere where there are a lot, large number of cases or the number of cases are growing, um, they you can ask if they've traveled to that area and you can ask them to quarantine and check their symptoms for the 14 days. Um, ideally, they would telework, which is what the Bosch is really um, strongly advocating for telework. Uh, so you, you probably wanna go that route. Uh, it's not a violation for an employee to inform their supervisor that a coworker's experienced symptoms. So if I'm working six feet away from Bob and Bob is, coughing and wheezing and having trouble breathing, you know, it's not, it's not a HIPAA or an ADA violation for me to reach out to Kendall and say, Kendall, you might want to touch base with Bob. He's exhibiting um, signs of coughing and difficulty breathing, and those would be COVID symptoms. Uh, accommodation, they can be temporary, so you could do it just for the pandemic. So telework is a reasonable accommodation. It's not a mandatory accommodation, although the uh, Vosh is strongly advocating for it, but you can you can also put um, timelines and end dates on those temporary accommodations for ADA that are pandemic related. Um, I think that covers it in the broadest strokes. I've given you real clear ones here. Uh, the one thing that uh, the ADA has come out with opinions and clarified on is that they a district is not required to accommodate an employee without a disability just because of a disability related needs of a family member or other person with whom they're associated. So if um, that you don't have to give an accommodation for caring for a child with a disability or a parent or things like that. Um, generally, you know, you would work through that in other ways, you know, flexible scheduling, things like that might come under FMLA, those kinds of things. But it's the ADA has said that if the person is not disabled, the accommodation isn't required. So you're going to want to look at other things. Um, child care hardships are not a reason to um, provide an ADA accommodation. That's where you'd want to look at other flexibilities like um, staggered schedules, alternate work hours, those kinds of things. That one, give me a call if you encounter it. It's, it's another kind of tricky one. Social and political expressions are infiltrating the workplace. Um, I get daily uh, updates from various professional organizations and law firms that I do their 
um, webinars. Uh, as the country becomes more polarized, they're sending out tips and reminders and opinions and things like that. Um, actually, the federal government has been as well. Uh, really about social and political expressions as they infiltrate the workplace. It makes it difficult because it impacts our morale. Um, it impacts productivity. It has such a negative impact. What you want to do is have the difficult conversations, and they are difficult conversations, but you need to be consistent in your application of policies. By, your, by the way, if you don't have one, let's adopt one, because um, you do need to be consistent and have an objective policy around um, expressions, uh, social, purely social and purely political expressions in the workplace. And it, you'll see at the bottom tip on this page, um, I just highlighted it, if you can see that. Um, that's based on all of the guidance that we've seen, um, legal guidance that's come out and guidance from the feds. This is what a policy, a good policy would be, a defensible policy would look like. It would prohibit purely political and social communications, and you can do that through any channels, whether it's apparel, emails, or whatever, it, as long as it's workplace related. Now, you can't prohibit them on their Facebook um, page, you know, as long as it's not the district's Facebook page. Um, prohibit employees from soliciting money or support for any candidates, uh, political or social causes. Um, you would prohibit the display and distribution of political and social materials and prohibit any communications in any district related form. That's really kind of, I touched on that with the first one. And then prohibit any contact that, or conduct, I'm sorry, conduct that disrupts operations or productivities or accompanied by violent, unlawful, aggressive, or other extreme behavior. And really, that's so subjective. The reason you want to have a policy around that and you want to um, have a candid conversation about the policy when it's implemented, adopted, and then be real consistent in its um, application is everybody has perception, perceives things differently. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. We have a, a gentleman here in our HOA, and he's well over six feet tall. Even though he's el elderly, he has a big booming voice because of um, his hearing. And he's also, you know, pretty solid big guy. And he comes up and he talks to you and he leans down and kind of gets kind of gets in your face because he's looking at you as you communicate, trying to hear you, and then he's so loud. Um, if you're familiar with this person, you know he's not being aggressive. However, we've had several residents advise and contact us, and one of them is, a, she's a real small lady with a real small dog, um, and she's kind of young, and she contacted us all distraught and wanted to know if she should contact the police because, um, she felt like this older man and she described the same guy came up and was asking her about her dog and wanted to know if that was her dog and how long he'd been on the property and things like that and I think he was trying to just strike up a conversation what's his name how long have you had him but it comes out as very you know tone and then his size and manner as aggressive to her so it's really all about perception and you don't know when somebody's going to feel like it's extreme or aggressive or um, threatening. So really have those candid conversations. They're hard to have, but have a policy, have the conversation, have it as a team, have it as a group. Um, and if you need to address it one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but that's one that's coming up more and more and we're seeing more and more in our professional channels around that. And really importantly, um, lead by example. Don't engage in it, um, don't as initiate, um, political or social discourse, whether it's, you know, share a joke or printed materials, clothing buttons, you know, stream on your radio for other people's to have to hear, put your earbuds in when you're in the workplace with coworkers. Um, lead by example and really just have a policy. It's, you know, it's, it's a growing issue and I just wanted to give everybody some tips around it and how to have the policy um, just as a proactive measure. Uh, I think, was that a 12? Yes, ma'am. If you don't mind, let's pause. You've got a number of questions in the chat box I want you to address, and some that I certainly don't want to be the translator for. So if I 
read your question. I hope that you certainly can come off mute and elaborate if needed. I know from a few slides back, our first question from Megan Dalton was, can the salary box be left and marked as optional? Megan, did you need to reference or expand on that? Well, to answer her question just as asked, no. Because what they're doing is they're trying to um, eliminate pay inequity. And what happens is once um, somewhere along the line an employer has lowballed somebody, they don't want them to carry that baggage. They want you to pay a fair, a fair rate based on what that person brings to the table as qualifications, experience, and what you, you know, what what you're anticipating being able to afford. So in short, no, you can't option the box. And the reason is you don't want to perpet they want to stop perpetuating um, pay pay inequities, pay disparities. Perfect. Thank you, Terry. Megan, if that doesn't capture it and you don't have a mic, just make sure you follow up in the chat box and we'll cover it before the next question. I have a question here from Deanna. Deanna if you can come off mute, she's asking, what do you mean regarding policy related to discussion of pay? Discussion during a personnel committee meeting? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't clear enough on that. Um, that's where somebody sits, you know, you um, give out pay increases and say you have variable pay increases. So if somebody gets excellent, they might get a 5% increase. Somebody gets more than acceptable, they might get a 3% increase. You don't want your employees um, normally employers don't want their employees sitting around talking to each other. It's basically employees talking to one another. Um, a lot of employers prohibit discussion of their pay because they may be paying engineer Bob 80,000 and engineer Sally 60,000 and they and if Sally finds out Bob's making 80 that's just created a, a legal problem for the the employer. So a lot of employers used to prohibit employees from discussing their pay with each other. Districts, as a matter of administrative operations, can discuss pay all they want. So your personnel committee, your board, what you need to eliminate is any policy for employees discussing their own pay with other employees. Thank you. Deanna, be sure to follow up in the chat box if that didn't cover your question. You have the question, Terry, from Sheila of where can we find the salary test? Oh, uh, if I haven't, if, if somebody can just email me, I'll send it so uh, Kendall can put the updated tests online if they're not already. Okay, I will follow up with you afterwards and double check and make sure we share that. Have those, yeah. We have a question from Kathy Clark. Is there an updated FLSA exemption testing template that can be shared? Yes. And that's what I just, that's the same as the same. Mm -hmm. um, Kendall, this is Blair. I would also note that the updated FLSA spreadsheet um, checklist, unless I missed it and they've just done a more recent update, we did update it with Terry's help in the desktop guide document mm -hmm. yeah. um, that went out in July. So it's there as well. So everybody should have a copy of it. Yeah, so good addition. I have a, another question for you from Mr. Newton of Shenandoah Valley, one of our directors. Is the required viral COVID-19 test the PCR test? Uh, the, uh, I think the PCR is that rapid test. That if it is the rapid test, then yes, that's the viral test. Okay. I know as a bit of follow-up too, Sharon Connor had noted in there that Hanover County is grappling with that antigen test versus the PCR as well. They were accepting the antigen, but now that it's been shown not to be as accurate, they'll most likely go to the PCR as a requirement to return to work. So helpful to know for all yeah. districts. That's any of the viral tests where they know swab your nose. Those are the tests you can do um, that are rapid. I've got a couple different questions left in the chat box before you wrap up and move to your next few slides. Uh, Linda Dunn asked, do the policy recommendations requirements need to be added to the district's personnel policy manual? Yes. I thought I, thought I could answer that one, but I appreciate you <laughs> saying it just to be sure. And I do also think uh, Blair has made an important note in the chat box too, that your slide on the screen now about social and political expressions, um, 
should only apply to staff. Um, many directors are in fact politically active and push certain issues. So keeping that Correct. in context yes. also. Yes. Should I add that, do you think, before we send this out? I can do that. Probably not a bad point to note that certainly directors play a different role in that component of it. Yep. I will add that before we send out or post the final one. Perfect. I give me a call whenever you get to no rush. I don't I'm apologies. Don't leave, Don. Um, and then I do have I think if we have time at the end, Sharon, we'll circle back to some of your follow-up leave bank questions that you had. But before I ask Terry to move on to our next few slides, I do also want to remind folks if you've not signed up for an individual appointment with Terry this afternoon, three slots remain. Uh, 330, 410, and 430. And if you're interested in one of those, private message Shannon Mitchum and she'll get you set up for this afternoon. Terry, feel free to keep on going and we'll run into your final few slides. Thank you. This has been so helpful. Oh, good. <laughs> um, the next thing is one thing that's really been challenging as folks linger in the remote workplace and in, a, in altered workplaces and is really building that resi resilience in our employees and how do we maintain those communications and engagement during you know all of these modified workplaces um, one really big important thing um, building that resilience in our employee helps prevent burnout and promotes their engagement and one really easy way to do that is keeping in touch and what um, everybody is recommending from our mental health professionals to you know, just best practices for administrative and managerial reasons is to do that two ways weekly and not, um, it, it's, it's really turning out to be quite fun. And I actually feel more connected at my work with some of my coworkers than I did when I was in the office. Um, there, everybody's recommending a one-on-one -on -one weekly and a group chat at least weekly. And that, that'll build the one-on-one -on -one to make sure somebody's feeling, um, connected and then also that rapport of the teamwork and the collaborations we're social na creatures by nature so we need to find those ways to connect um, those regular connections really need to be supportive not invasive so if you're like our hoa guy you might want to work on how you have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and group ones um, but here's some tips around that when you reach out make sure you're checking on just how's it going you know look for some problem solving ways that are out of the box and some flexibilities um, that you can adopt as cornerstones around these conversations um, both as a group and one-on-one -on -one about how's it going um, are we able to get our work done are we able to meet our goals you know our objectives the criteria that we've got from dcr and things like that um, the real the real challenge for a lot of folks um, is that it requires a lot of flexibility and adapting. So one of the things we need to focus on as we're having conversations is really focus on the outcomes. How do we get, you know, the budget prepared? You know, yes, I know we used to sit around a table and do it and we all had paper copies and wrote out and everything, but really what are our options now? And stay focused on how do we get the to the end result versus the rigidity um if you're here in richmond you know that you can get to downtown richmond in a number of ways you can go on 95 you can go on 64 or you can take the po white expressway well just because you've always taken the po white expressway doesn't mean you have to take that way to get downtown you could take um Parham Road all the way up to Broad Street and drive downtown. You could take Parham Road to Patterson and drive downtown. So think about what are the other ways we could get to where we need to be, not just how we've always done it. And that's been a real challenge that's created um, frustration and really um, a lot of anxiety for folks that if we figure, if we stay focused on just the outcomes and how do we get to the right quality you know, outcome that we need, you know, is it within spec? Does it meet needs? Does it meet the requirements, tick all the boxes versus the rigidity of how that gets done or when that gets done. Um, as long as we meet deadlines and, and the right outcome, that's where the focus, that's where these conversations kind of are beneficial. So if you treat it more of how's it going and then let's brainstorm around how we can make it better would be a good way to handle that. Encourage boundaries. Um, so, 
that's with the folks that, um, well, even me, <laughs> my husband's at home some days with me because he, he's the critical, um, he's essential personnel. And so he has a wonky schedule and some days he's home with me and I have to remind him that, honey, I'm working or honey, I'm going to be on a call. So he can be quiet and not come over and chat and tell me what, you know, did you see that Mika Mok should blah, 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 for blah, blah, blah. Um, so encourage boundaries, you know, times to take breaks um, and chat with their kids or their spouse or grab a snack, things like that. Um, set boundaries like we're going to put the compute, turn the computer off in the afternoon and to get everything done after I put the kids to bed, then I'll open my computer back up and do what, you know, finish what I need to do. So have them be flexible with those boundaries so they're not always trying to multitask and things aren't overlapping quite as much. Um, that does have a lot of impact and create a lot of stress on the employee's time and focus. Encourage those breaks, encourage regular activities. There are so many options for all levels of capabilities. So one thing is a good group thing to do. Um, this is really cool and I haven't done this, but I wanna do this with my, um, my uh, division at work is do the calm app where you play the rain for 30 seconds and everybody has to sit still. And it was interesting because they said, um, make sure everybody's videos on so nobody's cheating and you just breathe for 30 seconds together. Um, I thought that was really cool, but um, that might not work for everybody, but encourage them to, you know, just get up and do stretching, whether it's back bends or put stretch their arms behind their back. They can go for short walks. You can do a little bit of yoga. Um, the really amazing thing online, now you can find five minute anythings um, from exercise routines to walking, um, what was the walking things? What, some kind of walking cycle where you speed up, slow down, and warm up, speed up, slow down, something. That was pretty interesting. One of the ladies at work does it. Um, but there are so many ideas, links. There's YouTube, the Calm Act, where you can encourage those re them to use it even if you don't do it all together. But even all together, it has a lot of benefit from mental health perspectives. Make sure that when you're all, when you're, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, or as a group that you're talking shop and talking life, don't forget to celebrate that there are good things still going on. You know, did somebody have a birthday? Did somebody have an anniversary? Um, we used to have birthday lunches and sing happy birthday to everybody in um, my division at work. And so we've just uh, converted it to, I'm gonna grab my tuna sandwich and pickles and we do it as, you know, on our, we, have, we use Microsoft Team, we just do it on basically our version of Zoom still have those ways to connect so that there's continuity, which helps bring down those stress levels and maintain those connections and engagements. Um, make sure there's rob, round robin updates. Don't do all the talking. Um, I'm a bad example of that right now, I guess. Um, but do the round robin updates. And, you know, even if it's, you know, give us an update on at least one thing at work and one thing how, how things are going. Um, you can set up and use a bunch of free apps. Uh, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft made their Teams app free during this, and we've been using that at work, and that's just been pretty amazing because you can um, load your contacts in there and then use the the uh, use it as a phone and the video capability, just like Zoom, or just use Zoom if you have it. Um, introduce fun into the conversations. Laughter is really good medicine. It's a good way to break down barriers. Um, it decreases your stress hormones. It increases your immune cells and infection fighting antibiotics. Um, and more importantly, it's gonna trigger the release of your body's natural feel good endorphins. And that's gonna help them manage their um, stress levels. Um, it also, a lot, they're finding mental health professionals as we're getting a lot more of that introduced into our um, professional webinars and trainings finding that folks are going through the, the five stages of grief with the not being connected in the remote work or limited access to the workplace and they're not with all their coworkers or somebody they're used to be. So make sure we're looking for ways to make those regular connections that, that's, that sound and feel supportive, but still focus on the outcomes, you know, and getting the work done, but what we are whole persons. So just kind of acknowledging that. Um, even, oh, and this one I thought was really funny and I thought I'd share it. Even the Eeyores in our world need to be reminded there's good stuff in the world from time to time. And the example they gave is poor Eeyore. If everybody knows Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, he's the gloomy, gloomy donkey, like 
it's a nice day. Well, I guess so. But Eeyore's favorite thing is thistles. Now, thistles would not be a good idea, good uh, idea, a happy place for me. Might not be for your landowners, but they are for Eeyore. So be as productive and supportive as possible. Encourage them to talk about things that are important to them, even if it's thistles to you. Um, don't lose sight of the good. That's, that's really um, important, too. We try to end on that with all of our meetings at work. Uh, what, what's the best thing that's happened since we last chatted? Um, but more, but that's all really important, but we do need to make sure we don't lose sight of the one-on-one, -on -one, you know, when we're in the one-on-ones, that we are, you know, in, in respectful, proactive, supportive ways, say, clarifying our goals, reminding folks of their responsibilities, initially and in those weekly chats. And it's through things like, how's it going? Is everything on track? You know, have we, do you see anything that might derail getting, meeting our deadline or getting this accomplished? Make sure that initially and then ongoingly, we have those clear performance expectations. Well, we've fallen behind and that makes sense, but you know, let's talk about how we can get back on track and then what the expectation is and follow up on that. Um, be sure to, again, allow the flexibility and the how and the when. With kids in, at home, it may be that folks work best, you know, uh, during a, a toddler's nap time in the morning and afternoon and then after they put them to bed. So they might have three different work periods to balance their work life, but focus on make sure we're getting the results that we need, um, that the end result is what we need. It's a quality outcome. It's on time. It's on spec. It's on budget. And it achieves the desired and required result. Um, be sure to take uh, other person's temperature. You know, what are their challenges? Is there anything you need? And it's interesting because resources really, um, one really great question that um, Jim asks everybody is, what do you need from me? Resources don't always need to be money. It could be, uh, I need a letter, I need an introduction, or, you know, I need more time, or I need, you know, see what it is they need to make sure that their work is going smoothly and you're getting the outcomes you need and ask how they're doing. Make sure they're taking care of themselves, that they are taking breaks, they are setting their boundaries. Ask them what surprised them about working from home and how they're adapting, you know, what's working well, what's not working well. So those kinds of things are going to really be supportive of the employee and it's also going to keep that, that connection and that engagement level up. And are we all going to feel, you know, um, depressed and lonely and sad and not as productive. We're all going to have those moments. It's just human nature. It's going to be part of our emotional life cycle, but um, these will be good ways to help provide and ensure they're out there being as, you know, supported and productive as possible. So the districts are meeting their goals and are still being successful in a best way possible. Uh, the annual appraisal. Use the annual appraisal wisely. I know folks hate this, but I gotta tell you, it's one of my passions. Um, start with your job descriptions. They're really a cornerstone of the whole employment relationship as far as setting job duties and expectations. Make sure you keep them up to date and use those as the basis for setting goals and evaluating your job performance. You know, we need to do it at least annually. So annually, we're gonna discuss last year's results. But most importantly, when you're using your annual appraisal wisely, you're also going to use that same time, a two, basically as a two-part document, for goal setting, setting performance expectations, or resetting expectations. Suppose you've got employees who um, have been with you a long time. They're very successful. They get a lot of, um, a lot of work done. Say, they, say they're an education um, specialist. And so every year they're in the requisite number of classrooms and they're doing what they need to do to get the job done. But maybe things are transitioning and things have gotten stale with like the, uh, with the materials they're using. Maybe they're dated or whatever, or they're just not engaging kids the way they need to be engaged now with like, you know, all the bedazzling litter. Um, set some goals around that, you know, develop, you know, six new presentations for the year or during the pandemic, figure out how to transition and move at least three activities online. So set goals around, um, around those kinds of things 
so that you can kind of re-energize like longer serving folks. And then also it's fair to employees so that they know exactly what's expected of them. Um, I gave some examples here for like allocate 100% of your cost share or identify and reach out to 50 landowners we've never worked with before. Field our first Envirothon team. We gave that as a goal last year or yeah, this past year and had COVID not struck, we, we could have had two. So that was really impressive. Um, so you really never know if you set those expectations, people tend to rise to whatever level you expect. So that's why um, clarifying and being clear about that is really so important. Reach out to new target groups. Make sure that the appraisal or your conversation includes a clear why and how of the duties and goals, how what you're asking them to do make sure they understand whether it's within the appraisal or in the conversation around the appraisal, how it supports and achieves the goals of the district, how it meets the needs of the local and landowners. It again comes back to that connection piece that we all need to feel. Um, for example, if the district's goal is to have 75% of local landowners using no-till practices, then the goal, um, well, these two don't go together necessarily, but, or the goal is the, uh, or the district has a goal of doubling your educational outreach with children, that's where the, um, the district's goal could cascade down to something like in the first bullet, field our first Envir Envirothon team, engage homeschoolers, which we've never worked with before. So make sure they can see that natural cascade on how what they're doing is a value add and what the impact is. Um, discuss the expectation and goals, ensure clear understanding. That one I've talked around a few times. Um, troubleshoot ideas and options and challenges. You know, as you're setting the goals, remember that your workplace is dynamic. This year's done nothing but paint a picture of that. Um, so appraisal time is a really great time to set and reset goals and expectations, especially for um, employees on autopilot. Um, that's, that seems to be, I think we've gotten some stability in the workplace prior to COVID. So I think that started to come up a lot more in materials. And then um, I talked about the end of the year, the annual appraisal. It's also known as the end of the year appraisal or year end appraisal. Um, it really should be those two parts that I just mentioned. Um, part one is the review of the performance and results and accomplishments over the preceding 12 months. Use concrete examples to support your rating. Be prepared to stick to your assessment because it really is about how, do you, how does the district view the employee, how are they meeting your, op, your operational needs and goals as a district. It, um, so you, you can stick to your assessment. If you find that you know, they're on autopilot and doing just enough to get by, you know, acceptable job performance is fine. They're doing their job. Um, but if they think they're going above and beyond, this is where um, the little block with tips to the left are helpful. You can have each employee prepare and submit a self-assessment in advance of the annual meeting to discuss the feedback and ratings. That's important for two reasons. It gives you a valuable heads up on what the employee's perception is of their performance and what he or she valued and it ensures you don't forget to include what's important um, to the employee. So you may have forgotten that, oh yeah, you know, you held four rain shop barrels that are rain barrel workshops that sold out, you know, we only needed two. So that's above and beyond, that's outstanding. So you don't wanna forget things that are important. You know, oh yeah, you did rain barrels, but it may be really important information that takes them from acceptable to outstanding that they doubled them or increased it by 50%. So make sure it also helps you have those conversations. If you think they're doing enough to get by and are acceptable and they think they're outstanding, it'll help you be prepared to have those conversations to kind of merge those goals about it's, it's acceptable, but here's, here's what outstanding looks like. And then part two of the appraisal would be that goal setting and performance expectations. Remember to cascade those goals based on the district goals. So if we wanna increase um, our outreach to the next generation, you might wanna have, you know, identify homeschool groups to, you know, work with as well. Um, and then be sure that your goals are smart goals. They're specific, they're measurable, they're action oriented, realistic and time bound. And that's just an ages old smart. It's been in management books since I got my degree in the 80s. So, and it still holds true some version of that today with 
minor tweaks. So, you know, the more specific we can be and the more supportive we can be, you know, the more successful our employees are, the more successful our districts are. And I think, oh, no, that wasn't it. The mid-year, a lot of folks skip this part. Um, I'm glad I did scroll, scroll the screen. Use your mid-year evaluations wisely. Let folks know that, hey, you aren't on target or, you know, great progress. You could always use that time to um, modify goals, eliminate goals if something's changed, um, tackle tough conversations so that employees performance or attendance or something doesn't get off track, you can be proactive and preclude that. Um, that's a great way to just sit and have that dialogue about what's working well, what's not working well, what do you need, do you need any resources, do we need to modify anything, add, delete any goals, those kinds of things. So don't miss your mid-year opportunity because it's a really great way to keep um, employees on track and then also if the employees are on track, the district is on track to um, achieve their goals. And that's basically all I got. That was a lot. What are your questions now? Terry, can you hear me? I can. Perfect. I think we've covered a lot of them. There are still some slots open this afternoon if you'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one with Terry. I do want to circle back since we do have a few minutes and I don't see any additional chat box questions. Um, but also know that Sharon Connor had a handful of questions still on the leave bank item. Um, okay. Follow up that she had, does an employee need to use all of their sick leave or annual leave to qualify for a leave bank? Yes. Okay. Does a district need to budget for that time that is in the bank? Uh, the, the, um... I think in other words, do we need to set aside real money to cover that time? Actually, the money's really already set aside. So if you know that you give two weeks of annual leave and the, an employee's salary is $60,000, those two weeks are built into that $60,000. It's really not an additional pot of money. It's just shifting who you pay for that time that you've already accrued to someone else. Um, if they have huge accrual banks, then yeah, you need to make sure that you've still got um, funding in place to cover those huge leave accruals. Let's hope you have a huge leave. I think some have some big ones. I always think uh, Sharon wrote budget payouts on sick leave and annual leave should employee quit or retire so that they actually have the money to pay out on it. So it and could that also should be. Are, oh, that should already be part of your budget process to cover those as liabilities um, if that's how your policy dictates. So it should already be part of your budget, I would think, as either the budgeting process or just normal you know, annual leave, vacation leave, whatever you call it. We have a minute or two, so I would open it up before we wrap up to anyone who would like to come off mute and ask any wrap up follow up questions. All right, feel free to pause me. I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping before we wrap things up today. Terry, I can't thank you enough. I've learned a lot. I wrote a lot of notes. I tried to keep up with chat box questions and you're right. I don't think we leave this smarter, but certainly we have so many more questions I know that we'll have. So hoping Susie can talk in a moment about next steps for our admin ops committee because you've been such a great resource for us. I will also add again that um, maybe not this afternoon, but by tomorrow you should have an email with all of the PowerPoint that Terry did, as well as some of the materials she referenced. They're also on our website too, but we'll follow up with you via link. There are four time slots that remain with Terry for this afternoon, 150, 330, 410, and 430. These are 20 minute one-on-one -on -one slots. If you'd like to speak about any personnel issue in your district and have a safe and secure conversation with Terry and only Terry, I encourage you to take advantage of that. Please reach out to Shannon Mitchum and let her know if you're interested and secure one of those time frames. Unless I don't see any additional questions in the chat box, I think all are in agreement, Terry. You've been a huge help. I will toss it over to Susie to wrap things up for us. Thank you, Terry. That was amazing. I was taking a lot of notes myself. Um, it's, as always, you just do an incredible job. Um, the next steps for the admin ops committee is we are going to try and um, come up with a date 
Kendall and I are going to work on that after this call. Um, one thing we had discussed with Terry was maybe even having a session sometime in November that's just a Q&A. You know, things are changing so quickly and new rules and regulations. Um, so anyway, be on the lookout. We will be planning another admin ops committee meeting and then trying to set up a Q&A with Terry for um, any questions you may have after reviewing these materials a little bit more closely. Um, but I thank everybody for joining today. It was really great to have this many people online. And Terry, once again, thank you for all your hard work. You're welcome. I enjoy helping. <laughs> a round of applause, Terry. I can't thank you enough. Susie, you and I have our homework with a number of questions that were submitted that while if you have questions related to Terry's presentation today, follow up, we can do a Q&A with her next month. But I know a handful of questions were submitted to me within the last few days that weren't necessarily relevant for this presentation related to VRS and other things. And no, we'll try to be tackling them in admin ops committee meetings too. Sounds good. Unless there are other questions, guys, we will stop recording and end our meeting and we'll share the video with folks afterwards. I wish I could see you all, but look forward to the day we can be around the table and actually working through topics together. So in the interim, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us on your association staff. We're still working diligently and hard for, for districts. Thank you guys. Stay safe and well, and we'll connect soon. Thanks, Kendall.